Hello, and welcome to the first uh, Sean Kelly uh, Movies podcast in more than three months. Uh, I'm sorry for a long wait. I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how this podcast is going to work, so um, you'll probably notice um, one of the changes I made is that this episode is no longer called Lost Interviews, and it's just interviews because I figured that... I would occasionally post audio interviews whether or not they were lost. Uh, This is the case for um, today, as I am going to post uh, some interviews I did last week at the um, 2016 uh, Blood in the Snow Film Festival. I got to um, sit down with a handful of the um, directors and uh, talk about their films. I should probably warn in advance that um, some of these interviews are going to have uh, spoilers for the film. I'll uh, mark it down in the show notes which interviews have spoilers, so you can um, skip over those and just um, listen to the interviews you want to hear. So, uh, let's uh, get started. First up is my interview with Jared Bratt who's the um, co-director of the uh, film Streamer, uh, which is uh, about a um, lonely man who becomes quite obsessed with a uh, cam girl he finds out is living in his building. Take a listen. Okay, so um, where did the um, idea for Streamer come from? Okay, so, uh, well, it all spawned from a short film um, that I did in 2013 that premiered at uh, Blood in the Snow mm-hmm. and um, and I'm still submitting that short to this day <laughs> so uh, it's something I'm proud of very proud of and um, my co-director is not with us right now Vincent Pun he <laughs> shot the short and then somewhere in 2014 he just called me up and uh, kind of asked me what I thought about Streamer as a feature because the concept mm-hmm. itself is contained mm-hmm. and uh it's not nothing simple, but mm-hmm. if you wanted to apply it to a micro-budget kind of uh, template, mm-hmm. it would seem right for the doing. And then he asked me about co-directing it, mm-hmm. and that's kind of where, and that just got the ball rolling. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I, I kind of noticed that Streamer is not really a horror film per se, but mm. it does get disturbing at first. Yeah, well, I'd like <laughs> to think there's a through line of, yeah. like, just unsettling yeah. vibe. And you're right, it's not a straight-up horror movie. I guess I've been seeing... Uh, I really like the blurb in the uh, in the program booklet mm-hmm. that uh, Carolyn did about it, where she says the it's for anyone who's, you know, ever... Uh, the horrors of loneliness and heartbreak. Mm-hmm. And I really think that's the horror right there, is the loneliness, the accumulated loneliness, and how that can take its toll on people mm-hmm. and lead to the darkness. And uh, in that sense... That's where that's. I mean, that's a that's a horror story in the, yeah. to me. So, uh, yeah, we've been calling it a psychological horror or a psychological drama. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the horror of the mind and. Yeah, it's it's definitely like the ultimate what if. <laughs> yeah. Like like, what if a, you find out that a cam girl is living in your building? <laughs> yeah, I, you know what? That's I think that's like the. Uh, it's like the biggest uh, stretch I think we ask the viewer to take is that idea that this guy went back to the laundry room where he happened to see this, you know, this webcam girl in the flesh the first time. He actually went back down there and just waited. And then we do a montage, so time has passed. How long did he actually wait there? But what are the odds you're going to go back to a place where you ran into somebody? Yes, you're in the same building. And let's say if you go back to the laundry room on like a Sunday night, when a lot of people do their laundry you might increase your chances mm-hmm. but it's a it's a it's almost like a slight uh stretch of whimsy mm-hmm. um but ultimately yes yeah the what if factor like what if you ran into somebody you were engaged as a client kind of uh pay pay for some sort of reward mm-hmm. or uh, we definitely talked a lot about how even though the guy does want some sort of sexual uh, interaction at the end of it, like any client does with mm-hmm. the stuff, the fact that he would just keep saying, I just want to talk, I just want to talk, and she keeps like hounding him to do her job, which is you know, to, to strip at some point, 
mm-hmm. and uh, and we do feel there's part of him that really does just want to talk because that ties into the, the starving for just an intimate connection but there is still that like deeply uh, primal kind of yeah can you just take your clothes off so <laughs> I love how there's those two parallel layers and it's not one or the other, it's kind of everything and you just gotta, he's probably serious about this, but but he's more serious about this, but like, yeah, it's just a juggling act. Like, oh, I, I would argue that the actress had the biggest challenge by playing two off two different personas. <laughs> yeah, I would even say three, but uh, I completely agree with you. Oh, yeah, the, the, the fantasy grows. <laughs> yeah, so, like, you got, like, the, you know, the in, the intentionally kind of grounded, uh, slightly more bland, real-life person, not working, mm-hmm. like, struggling actress. You got the uh, sexualized, on-the-clock webcam persona. Mm-hmm. And then you've got the hallucinogenic kind of in the mind internal dialogue represented in the physical mm-hmm. form, slash the webcam persona coming to life. So like, yeah, it's uh, it's really um, yeah. I don't know. She did a great job, mm-hmm. Tanya. Well, I think there is a point in the film where you kind of like question how many of the interactions really happened. <laughs> yeah, and. Uh, you know, um, and there's been some, like, uh, I guess confusing response in that because some people don't want to be, uh, have that kind of wonder. They want to know, tell me what was real, what was not. <laughs> and, um, like, I wouldn't be, uh, I wouldn't be, you know, if somebody thought, like, the private camp sessions weren't really real, I could see how, like, the absorbed and read kind of sinful fantasy thing kind of okay maybe it's not we we didn't exactly just shoot like try to keep it interesting visually a lot of times and that kind of ties into the man- manipulation of the color palette yeah i know i noticed that um some scenes were in black and white yeah <laughs> which is uh depending on who you speak to is a don't like it's gonna take people out of the movie and then you're gonna cause people to realize but actually i've seen a lot of uh nice comments about how it keeps it more so visually stimulating and mm-hmm. thus the viewers off guard mm-hmm. caught off guard or how the black and white is maybe this uh, you know a representation of a more gentler side of reality when contrasted with again the sinful red and in the mind and mm-hmm. well, uh, the film does say a lot about loneliness <laughs> yeah and, it, uh, and how lonely people try to use artificial means to <laughs> Well, there's, I mean, yeah, I think there's, uh, there's that, and then you bring in the addition of, uh, like, look, I think if we see, I believe this, like, if you see an image of uh, somebody, it could be anybody, uh, I mean, we could do it right here, but, like, if you see somebody sitting in darkness and the only light coming is the computer or the phone, Mm -hmm. I think we can all relate to that idea of constantly looking at our, you know, technological, uh, companions almost or mm-hmm. that source into social media or like what other people are doing so uh, the loneliness and then the loneliness applied to like well he's spending time with his computer like uh, I just like that final private camp session when the guy's sitting there and we just open in on him and it's just silent and you can tell he's thinking and then you hear her voice say penny for your thoughts and it almost feels like it's just a guy talking to his computer mm-hmm. but I feel like there's a lot in that like there's a lot of uh, there's a whole can of worms to get into when dealing mm-hmm. with uh, you know. the te- and, and, and the um, ending is kind of haunting <laughs> oh well, I'm happy to hear that yeah <laughs> cause uh, we had some ideas about alternate endings mm-hmm. where we would actually where we'd go um, cause we did to a certain extent rewrite the script as we were shooting it it kind of makes a good connection to the um, video blog that opens the film because it's obvious that the um, lead has like major self-esteem issues. Yeah. And like pretty much once his fantasy is shattered, he does not know what to do. I like, uh, it's a great bookend, I think. Yeah. And uh, and we also bookend literally with the aspect ratio as well. So um, it worked out, I think. So I pretty much figured if, if he can't have this fantasy girl, no one can. That's it. <laughs> I mean, when we were talking about why why commit the act of murder, mm-hmm. that's exactly it. Yeah, you know? just nailed it. 
Because, uh, yeah, you know, I think, um, like, we had other ideas for endings. In fact, we shot an, a different ending and one scene that ties into this whole other meta layer to the story that was just too ambitious for <laughs> what we were doing. So we took out that scene and then we took out that ending so you would never know that there's another part of the story that's just way too meta. And mm -hmm. we felt like going with the ending we have now just not only made everything tighter, but uh, is a little more bolder. Because mm -hmm. I think our prior ending was going to be more of like, it was all a dream. <laughs> not that, really, but it was dabbling in that territory. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think that. Yep. Cool, man. And that was my interview for uh, Streamer. Okay, so uh, next up we have my interview with um, Nick McGannotti. Uh, I don't know if I've pronounced that right. Um, who is the uh, co-director of the uh, film Capture Kill Release, um, which was actually one of my uh, favorite films from the festival. So this was a uh, found footage film about a... Um, married couple who are um, uh, planning a murder. So I'm actually going to play a clip from the trailer for the film and then we'll get right to the interview. Enjoy. I don't know, it's sticking a pig. Never stuck a pig before. It's like prom night for murder. You know, it could really be anybody, huh? You could kill someone with your bare hands. So how would you do it? Random, but not too random. You gotta be able to plan around it. Take him down to the basement because it's quiet. We can put some plastic down. They tie him up down there while he's sleeping. You have to wait for him to wake up first, right? This is key. Can we please get the cat back? The kid's not going back. Kitty is gonna go for a little swim. Have you ever even held an axe before? I think it looks like I have, don't you? Wrap the pieces up individually. Take him out somewhere quiet and secluded. Bury the pieces, and he never comes back. That was awesome. <laughs> You can't do this with a cat. How are you going to do it with a person? I'd probably throttle him somehow. Take a rope or a belt. You're making this so personal. Torso, arms, legs, head. This is just the way. You've taken this way too far. I'm not doing this. Put it down. We have to do it right. Can we do it right? I can't do Can this. we please do it right? Tell me what you did. What we did? Come on. Just kill him Let and everything will be fine. Get that out of my face! Saying goodbye. Okay. <laughs> so, um, where did the idea for the film come from? Uh, the idea came from it's. It started just as uh, as a lot of good ideas come from is just having a conversation with friends. Uh, I was talking to um, who the co-director of the film. And we were talking about terrible crimes that people commit and uh, instances where there's more than one person involved. We were saying that, you know, you read all the time when, you know, when somebody commits a crime, it's, 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 it's terrible, but you can almost get that this person was wired wrong and that's just something that they felt compelled to do. But we couldn't understand why these crimes you read of where more than one person is involved. Uh, and that's what we started talking about. If you know, you read about couples that commit murder and wonder how, how does that happen? How does that conversation start where they say, yeah, I think this is a good idea. And more than one person jumps on board with that. So that was the thread that we started to pull. Uh, and then we started doing some research online just out of sheer curiosity and found some really dark stuff that really turned into, yeah, I think, uh, I think we got to make a movie from this. Uh, was it always intended to be like a found footage film? Early, early stages when it was just, again, just a conversation, mm -hmm. not necessarily going to be a found footage film. But, you know, we started, we started really exploring themes of uh, you know, our selfie culture, narcissism, you know, mm -hmm. we, everything's got to be on Instagram now with 
uh, getting ourselves out there, how we present ourselves to the camera, how we present uh, things is sort of the perfect life. And we, we thought of, you know, if you're committing a crime, you have to present it as sort of the perfect crime. Um, so at that point, we switched the... The, the focus that it was actually a big part of the film that we're doing so at an idea stage it wasn't necessarily found footage but as soon as we started writing words on paper that would have become a, become a script that's uh, that's where we went from there well I, I did think that the film has like one of the better why do they keep filming all the time explanations <laughs> thank you we do we do constantly see in reviews that it's like okay this is another found footage but you know check it out for this this reason so yeah, yeah. Probably the, the lead actress was the most impressive in the film, and that, she definitely conveyed like a very eager sociopath. Yes, she's <laughs> yeah, she's she's fantastic, yeah. and through just she she brought so much to the performance, and yeah, she is she is great. Mm -hmm. So um, well, as the plot develops, it comes obvious that the um, husband is only going along with it because of <laughs> his, his love for his wife and. Then, as as things start to get more real, he starts having second thoughts. So, um, how did you go about presenting that? Uh, we thought of it as the one of one of the analogies we we presented it as as uh, almost like fantasy football. <laughs> that this thing you kind of get behind that it's fun to talk about. You know, I'm as twisted as it sounds. People all have sort of that conversation at some point that. You know, it's uh, whether it's what would you do for a million dollars or would you do this or that type of thing that uh, we looked at it that it's something that he didn't necessarily think was actually going to happen. Uh, and, you know, as he goes through, his uh, his wife is so pleased and she keeps rewarding him as uh, as things move along that... Um, and then once it reaches a point where things become a little bit too real, he wants to back off, and she's not allowing it yeah, to happen at, at the, all. At the start of the film, um, the, playing the murder essentially becomes foreplay. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. Everything, everything very much is foreplay, as you say, the, yeah. and that's really what draws him in. And she, she knows that it's the whole carrot and stick mentality that she's drawing him along. That the further he goes along with it, the more he talks about it, the more he goes with planning it. She. Uh, she she rewards him for it and he loves it until it becomes a real thing until it's yep here's a victim and we're going to move forward then he kind of pump tries to pump the brakes and she doesn't allow it yeah. also i also liked how the film kind of like moves between like being darkly humorous and then outright disturbing <laughs> yeah, well we we thought that people people come to see mm -hmm. horror movies to see bad stuff happen yeah. so we we almost wanted to make it seem like a fun thing at first because you don't come in and think like i'm going to be really disturbed you say yep i'm ready to see some blood and this and this and that happen we wanted people to be enticed by it at first and then as it sort of moves along they don't want to see it anymore but we it's it's too late like well, like, like well like I, I you know there comes a point when you watch enough horror films you become desensitized to the violence yeah I was not like I, I like I was cringing when he was like doing the sawing and just oh. yeah, and that's and that's what we wanted. We it probably got, helped that it was incredibly realistic, but well, our prosthetic. Yeah, we've, <laughs> well, one of the, one of the things that we've said when we were coming up with uh, when we we're talking about this movie and birthing the the ideas behind it is, you see so many movies where somebody comes in and they shoot ten guys in a room. Mm -hmm. All of those are people and all of those are bodies that somebody has to deal with. We just wanted to focus on one. And yeah. we thought getting rid of one of them has got to be incredibly disturbing. Mm -hmm. And and we didn't uh, we didn't want to pull any punches with that. Yeah. I was a tad worried about the cat because <laughs> animal deaths are never good in film. Yeah, no, <laughs> people are fine with killing people, but as soon as you want to hurt an animal, they they walk away. I, I think, noticed a few walkouts. Yes, we, the cat scene. yes, we had a, we had uh, a number of walkouts in the cat scene. <laughs> I can assure you that the cat is fine. I know I know this cat personally. Yeah. I love him very much. I specifically picked him because I'm like, this is the cutest cat I know. We've got to get him in this. But like, movie. Uh, well, it's, it's, I think it's like an old fact for sociopaths that they start start off with animals before moving to humans. Yeah, and that's that's again that I that the way the way that I'm saying that we wanted people to think this is like something. her saying it's just a cat. 
Yes. <laughs> this and and the, the way I was saying that people go into a movie like this wanting to see bad stuff happening, and then we wanted them to not want it anymore. But since you've signed up for it, it's going it's going to happen. You have, you have to pay for saying that you want to see people get killed. Here you go, it's, and it's a terrible thing. Mm-hmm. And the cat is the real uh, start to everything that happens. Well, there. It's, it's like some scenes where like an animal death like turns me off in the film. Like um, a few years ago, I'm um, cheap frills. I'm um, mm-hmm. like had a scene yep. where. He microwaves a dog, and that just okay. I'm done with this film. Yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully, hopefully you weren't one of our uh, our walk. No, no, I, I I I stay for home. Yeah. I, 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 I it's my it's my, it's my policy never to walk out. Yeah. <laughs> because well, thanks for sticking around. <laughs> like I did, I did like the film. Oh, thank you. I did kind of feel that it was like maybe stretching a bit when it was when she went to the second victim. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's. Um... We've heard it, some stuff but, where it's like, is was this meant for a sequel or something? But we, you know, obviously a sequel is not something that we want to do. We but it, to... it did tie together in the end. Yes. <laughs> when you realize that the husband's going to pretty much take the fall for everything. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, he's not left in a good place yeah. when uh, when things are done. Mm-hmm. And that's where we're ended. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and that was my interview for Capture Q Release, which I recommend you check out whenever you can. Next up is my interview with uh, Charlie Lawton and uh, Brendan Welton about their short film, No Trespassing. This is a relatively short interview, so I'll just get right to it. So what's the film about? <laughs> uh, film's about, it's about uh, a girl who's lost in the woods and then gets separated from her friend and is being sh- followed by some kind of unseen evil that just kind of keeps getting closer and closer behind her. Mm-hmm. Um, that's about all I can really say without spoiling it all. Okay. Uh, so, um, how long did you work on the film? Work on? Uh, it was almost a year ago. We shot it uh, in December last year. Kind of mm-hmm. came up with the idea around now and just said, want to shoot something before the year's out. What can we pull together? We knew this location. So, okay, well, we have this these creepy woods. Let's use those. Mm-hmm. And it kind of built up from that. So, mm-hmm. shot it last year. Uh, I was about done editing around March of this year. Mm-hmm. Then it went on to uh, it's silent, so most of it's through ambience and sound. So then it went off to Josh Hemming, who was our sound producer, and he spent a couple months toying around with it and mm-hmm. let it here. It's done about, what do you say, April? Yeah, about April. Mm-hmm. And then just started submitting to festivals. Mm-hmm. So. so, what was the biggest uh, challenge you've been challenge uh one of the actresses she's in fairly heavy prosthetics mm-hmm. and uh that covered her eyes mm-hmm. and we shot this out in the woods so we had to get her do the makeup in the house that was near the woods and then get her out onto set and mm-hmm. uh it was about a five minute walk when you could see and about a 20 minute walk when you were literally blind mm-hmm. so it was one crew member and myself and a few other people kind of on each side of her helping her walk through it was like okay there's a route here step over it's, we didn't want her to fall and break an ankle it's not mm-hmm. being able to see for and the prosthetic that as well <laughs> so um, what was the best thing about the best thing is seeing it all come together like um, mm. especially hearing the sound mix um, from Joshua is just hearing it come together it really was actually creepy like it's mm-hmm. we had watched the dailies a bunch of times and the first time we saw it put together with the sound everyone was just turned the lights on and was like okay that actually works that's good mm-hmm. so I think that was probably my, my favorite part of it mm-hmm. it was uh, yeah it was just a fun shoot it was out in the middle of nowhere there was a bunch of people we worked with before we had a shorthand so everyone kind of knew what they were doing without being told which was always great for me as the producer uh, yeah, it was just it was a quick lot of and fun. easy. It was, we shot in it was a day quick, and a half. Easy shoot. Yeah. yeah, that's about it. It was just the entire experience of shooting. It was easy and remarkably straightforward. Yeah, yeah. it was. Uh, wish they could all be like that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And that was my short but sweet interview for the short film No Trespassing. Uh, now we're on to my uh, final interview, which is with. Uh, Torin Langan for his anthology film Three Dead Trick-or-Treaters. Uh, I should note that this interview was done 
before I saw the film, but I should add that uh, Three Dead Trick-or-Treaters ended up being my favorite film of Blood in the Snow, so uh, keep that in mind as you listen to this interview. Uh, could you talk about what the film is about? The film is about Three Dead Trick-or-Treaters is an anthology film that follows five different stories of dark underground Halloween rites rituals and traditions Mm -hmm. so it all sort of all the films follow sort of a similar structure and they're all they all take place around the halloween season not all the films are necessarily about halloween Mm -hmm. but they're all you know taking place within that within that time of year when things are just a little bit awry and spooky so yeah and they're all they're all told completely without dialogue and they all follow they're all sort of in different worlds, but they follow a similar sort of timeline. Like, the first one takes place on Devil's Night, second one takes place on Halloween, one after that takes place on November 1st, and then the fourth one is a little bit farther into November. Uh-huh. So, they all follow they all follow some sort of timeline, even though they're not necessarily all connected in the same way. Uh, so, it, um, it says here in the description that it combines your previous short films. Yeah, yeah, so so Fondue and Malleus Malficarum, those were two shorts. Fondue I released in early 2013, so this project's been four years in the making. Mm-hmm. But even when... Well, I, I've, I've seen Maleficent. Oh, okay, oh, I gotcha. Uh, well, because even when I did those films, mm-hmm. I knew that I was going to do an anthology film, mm-hmm. and that's, that had been something I'd been working towards for years at that point. Mm-hmm. But um, knowing that I hadn't really, like, broken out, so to speak, into the Toronto scene yet, I wanted to release those two shorts independently mm-hmm. as well so that I could um, get the ball rolling and in future, at this point, have some have some uh, some sort of reputation surrounding those films so that, you know, the anthology would be more more well received and it wouldn't just be a complete shot in the dark um so those two films were released in advance to sort of gain awareness for this project but uh three-fifths of the movie is all is all new content so the vast majority of it is all new stuff and fondue's had a little bit of a remaster done to it since it was the first one yeah Uh, so uh, so how would these shorts like connect together how would they connect together uh, well, again, they're all, they all follow sort of a similar structure. They're all to do with uh, these dark Halloween rites and rituals. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, so the wraparound story is the, the conceit of the wraparound story is there's this deranged writer whose calling card for these murders is he tacks uh, horror stories that he's written to the tombstones of the people that he kills. Um, his hope being that because he's been rejected from so many publications that he's submitted to, that if he can't go down in history as a great writer, he can at least go down in history as a murderer who was also a writer. So in some way, he's still going to be he's mm-hmm. still going to be going down in history as a writer. So he's a very he's an egomaniac, and mm-hmm. uh, his lack of success drives him to uh, to the act of murder. Mm-hmm. Yes. So how would you say that this differs from other anthologies? Uh, well, a lot of anthology films that have been coming out in recent years, um, you know, they have multiple they have multiple directors, or it'll be one of these projects where a producer will assemble a bunch of filmmakers who've done shorts and they'll sort of tailor or sort of cobble an anthology out mm-hmm. of that. Um, which makes sense. I mean, like, short films aren't particularly uh, profitable in the sense that you can't, you know, get a distribution deal for just a short. It's very it's very difficult mm-hmm. to, to get distro for a short. So it makes sense that people are, you know, pooling their films together and doing these anthologies. Mm-hmm. But oftentimes I've found in recent years that these anthologies often, they feel very they feel very disjointed because all the films have a different look they'll often be in different aspect ratios they won't yeah they won't they won't be consistent in tone whereas this film i directed wrote shot edited uh sound designed everything mm-hmm. myself and i have to say even though it was shot over the course of four years the films are remarkably cohesive mm-hmm. in tone and it's very consistent so i think that makes it a little bit different there aren't a lot of anthology films so, being produced right now that so are be like that somewhat similar to trick or treat Tr- yeah similar to trick or treat um similar to creep show in that way that mm-hmm. again creep show was all directed by george romero so mm-hmm. yeah it's it's more of a it's a traditional anthology film in that mm-hmm. sense but again there's also you know the element of turning it on its head and doing a whole film without dialogue which uh, mm-hmm. which gives it a little bit of a unique oh well, that's the biggest challenge of that <laughs> you know what it's actually interesting for as long as i've been doing films i mean usually i'm working with with small casts i mean mm-hmm. i'm working with you know whatever resources i have available to me like this thing was not made for a lot of money mm-hmm. um 
So working with a small cast, you often end up doing a film about one or two characters sort of stuck in a situation. And especially if you're doing a film about one character, there's no reason for that character to be speaking. Mm -hmm. So it seemed like a natural extension even as I started adding more characters to my, to my stories. I had become very accustomed to these sort of solo pieces and it just, I, I guess I just developed a sense of storytelling without needing, without needing dialogue. I actually have a hard time writing dialogue into my stuff because I, I just find pantomime to be a lot more suspenseful and a lot more engaging and it's also universal. Mm -hmm. This film could play in any country and it would still more or less be understandable. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, but it also, it became a challenge sort of near the end. It, I was curious as to how far I could push my storytelling um, without the use of dialogue. And I think that I pushed that to as far as I could with the final segment of the film. I think that's about as far as you can take that idea mm -hmm. uh, before it starts before it starts losing the audience. So I, I, think I, I think I walked right up to the very edge of what type of story you can tell without, yeah. without dialogue involved. So it's going to be interesting to see how that plays to an so audience it, as well. There'll be still sound in the film. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, no, there's, I mean, characters <laughs> scream and pan. Like, there's, like, this, isn't, this isn't a world where everyone is, like, is a mute, per se. Yeah. There's, there's still a whole soundscape to the film, but, um, but no, no characters ever speak at any point. And also, the movie, the characters in the film... The, the overall, I'm not sure if it's a conceit per se, but most of the films have to do with a character being brought into this this tradition or this um, some sort of some sort of dark ritual that they're being introduced to. So they're just along for the ride, and the audience is sort of being made aware of like what like what is happening as the character is going through it. So. In the film, everyone already knows what's going on. They're just going through the motions, and we're watching. We're watching this sort of protagonist's reaction. Um, so, because all the characters already know what's going on, and they're going through the motions, there's really no need for dialogue unless it's to explain what's happening. But all of that stuff's on screen. So, I just I, I found it fairly easy within that structure to to avoid dialogue. Um, but yeah, so but obviously, like I intend to, you know, incorporate actual speaking parts into future projects. But this was definitely an interesting exercise, for sure. Okay, that's it. <laughs> Great, thanks so much, man. And that was my interview for Three Dead Trick or Treaters, which I ended up quite enjoying, and it was my favorite film of Blood in the Snow this year. And that's it for my interviews. Uh, you can. Read my uh, reviews of the films over at the site, and um, I promise there won't be another three months before another episode of this podcast. So, um, I'm Sean Kelly, and I'll see you soon.